Hey everybody, so I have an absolutely phenomenal book that I want to review, and uh, Mitzi's going to keep us company, and uh, yes, she is, and um, the book in question, by the way, if you're wondering how I get these done so quickly, it's because I'm usually reading like three or four books at a time. Anyway, the book I uh, just got done reading was The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea by Yukio Mishima, uh, an absolutely uh, phenomenal piece of writing. It's very difficult to tell, a, to give a setup for this story without telling the entire story. Uh, it's one of those things where, like, to summer, to, to give you the idea of what it's about, you kind of have to run through the whole thing. So, to, um, to summarize, if you want an entirely spoiler-free uh, commentary, just know that, yes, it's a phenomenal piece of writing, and I highly recommend it. Now, uh, Yukio Mishima is an interesting figure within Japanese history, an interesting figure within the larger literary canon. Uh, he is a very, very uh, fascinating individual, both as a writer and as a and as a public persona. Uh, and so, what is um, it's interesting, but he's almost his life is almost as well known as his fiction in the sense that. Uh, towards the end of his life, he was already Japan's uh, one of Japan's top novelists, uh, shortlisted for the Nobel Prize, and uh, a worldwide literary sensation, a bestseller in his time, very successful in his own time, and very highly regarded in his own time. So he achieved a great deal as a writer and was highly regarded in intellectual circles. But towards the end of his life, he died at age 45 of suicide, and towards the end of his life, he um, assembled a, an army, a private army, called the Tatnakai, which means Shield Society. They favored a very, a very hardline return to traditionalist Japanese values that Mishima felt had gone by the wayside uh, since the Japanese got crushed in World War II. So Mishima wanted to restore the emperor to his full authority and wanted to and and then also wanted to end the international agreements that the uh Japanese military had made which in the wake of World War II which said that they would only ever maintain a military for defensive purposes. Uh so that has potential if you look into the very brutal imperialistic history of Japan, especially during World War II, that has very, very dire implications. So, on the one hand, the Tatnakai was feared and it was <clears throat> despised, especially by people on the far left. But at the same time, it was also kind of regarded as a national joke because Mishima was widely known for his flamboyance, for being an only ever semi closeted homosexual. And a lot of people, the the snickering that went on behind you know behind his back and everything was that a lot of people thought that the Tatnakai was just uh, his excuse to get a bunch of strapping muscular young men to run around and shower with him and everything like that. So <clears throat> uh, on um, uh, 1970, November 25, and I, I say it that way because my band Axis of Empires has a song about the last day of Yukio Mishima's life. It's not a political song at all, but it's just kind of documenting this very bizarre occurrence. Anyway, um, the, uh, but we say it that way in the song. Anyway, uh, the song's called Sword in the, Chrys the Sword in the Chrysanthemum, by the way. Uh, but anyway, we, um, <clears throat> you know, on, on the last day of his life, the Tatnakai seized control of this Japanese military base, took it over, and, uh, Mishima went out on the, uh, went out on a balcony and delivered this, uh, very passionate speech about, uh, returning Japan to its traditional values, which got him booed. He was hoping that the soldiers would, uh, he, he was hoping that the soldiers would be inspired to overthrow the Japanese government. They were not. They thought he was ridiculous. He came back inside, and he and another member of the Tatnakai, widely believed to be his lover, uh, committed, uh, harakiri together. Um, Apparently, from what I understand, Mishima was the last person in Japanese history to have ever committed harakiri. Um, that may be that may actually technically not be true because I think his uh, his partner died after him, so it, he may be second to last. But it's the last known case of harakiri in the history of Japan. And and when I say harakiri, he literally you know uh, took the uh, took a knife and disemboweled himself and then had his head cut off. It's a very bizarre occurrence, and uh, but it's one that allows us to see uh, 
to see Mishima's writing through a very sinister and very disturbing, but very, very insightful lens as far as what he's trying to say with his writing. Um, and so I say all of that, again, Mishima is easily in my top 10 favorite writers. My number one favorite writer is Harlan Ellison. Number two is Haruki Murakami. Yukio Mishima is definitely up there. I've not bothered to sort out the rest of them. But he, in his writing, uh, irrespective of the politics that he embraced towards the end of his life, irrespective of uh, anything he may have done in that regard, the, the Tatnakai or anything like that, his writing is beyond phenomenal uh, on just about every possible level. And you have to understand, he was a sensation and a success in his own time. He was very highly regarded, highly regarded in intellectual circles, highly regarded in literary circles, shortlisted for the Nobel Prize a number of times, and um, just tremendously, tremendously well-received in, in his own time. So this is not the this is not a case of a a, a, a bitter unsatisfied uh, fringe writer, uh, you know, uh, losing it and going off and becoming a radical. This was very much a case of uh, somebody who is a, a a national icon as a writer in his time. Anyway, that's enough backstory on Mishima to give you an idea of the bizarre and fascinating uh, world that he occupied. But un you have to understand basically that he was a he was a person of many contradictions. On the one hand, he rejected Western modernism, but he craved acceptance by the Western American literary establishment. He was a he was a passionate, passionate supporter of a return to traditional Japanese values, but he was at the same time an extremely, um, an extremely flamboyant, um, uh, as you know, as I said, barely closeted. He was never, he was never open out and about. He did have a wife and kids, but he was, he was very well known to travel in uh, the gay nightclub circles to uh, associate with uh, cross-dressers, drag queens, all of that. So there are all of these contradictions. And Mishima was obviously a man being pulled in a lot of different directions. But at, throughout all of it, he had a philosophy. And it's a philosophy that would be very alien, to, especially to a lot of modern people and especially to a lot of Western audiences. But one of the things, and I realize this is all a, pre a long preamble before I'm telling you anything about the actual book, but... One of the things that Yukio Mishima believed was that a person should die when they are in a state of physical perfection. He believed that your entire life is leading up to the moment that you die, that how you die is the most important thing in your life. And this is not some passing, uh, you know, edgelord idea. He really did believe this. And the thing is, that sounds very bizarre to us today. But if you stop and think about it, if you took that, if you took that philosophy to the samurai, if you took it to the soldiers of ancient Rome, uh, cultures like these, uh, the you know, go as far as the Vikings and all of these very warlike societies and everything. If you took it to them, they would say, well, of course, that makes total sense. Of course you want to die when you're at peak physical health, looking as beautiful as possible, live fast, die young, live a good-looking corpse. You know, of course you want to, of course that's how you want to go out. They, they would consider it embarrassing and, um, it, 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 they would consider it a, an embar embarrassing and a failure if you lived into ancient old age and died in a nursing home. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very... It's a very odd philosophy to us now, but it's something Mishima really believed. And we know he, re and we, you know, it's something he espoused, and it's, and we know he was sincere because he died that way. Um, and so, uh, and, and, uh, so it's, it's a, uh, it's a very, um, it's a very interesting story. Anyway, uh, his life is an interesting story. Anyway, the fisher, the fisherman, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea, gives us an opportunity to to really see that philosophy playing out in a very interesting way. 
So it's the story of uh, a sailor. I'm going to uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to be using their their uh, their archetypal names um, or, uh, or or their occupational names a lot. But um, the uh, the sailor Ryuji, uh, who falls in love with a uh, a woman who manages a um, uh, manages a uh, clothing store uh, off the shore where uh, near the shoreline where his um, his vessel his sailing vessel comes in and out. He's a commercial sailor, and he lives a you know he lives a uh, fun a fun filled passion. Uh, passionate life on the far sea, you know, the high seas and live, really truly lives for it and everything. And, uh, he meets a, a woman and her son. And, um, one day, uh, when the, when they're touring the, the vessel that he sails on, uh, he meets them and he and the woman, uh, the mother fall madly, passionately in love. And Mishima is excellent at presenting a very sumptuous surface level narrative about the uh about the sailor and the mother falling in love he does this uh fasako is the uh the mother he they do a um uh, just a wonder he does a wonderful uh store a wonderfully eloquent beautiful story that really lulls you into a false sense of security the boy uh, on the other end, the son, on the other hand, Noboru, is um, a member, he's uh, about 13, and he's a member of a gang, of ju a junior high school gang, uh, full of 13-year-old uh, boys who deeply and, uh, deeply and uh, sincerely reject and distrust everything to do with the adult world. And it is, um, it, it's a very, they're, they're, uh, they are ruled over by a, um, a gang leader who's only ever referred to as the chief. And they reject, um, <clears throat> they reject the adult world as being superficial and illusory and a giant lie and a giant, uh, a giant sellout. They're like a, a militant, a psychotic militant version of Holden Caulfield's worldview or something like that. And so initially, Noboru regards the sailor as a hero, as this, you know, this noble man who sails the high seas. But then when it turns out that uh, the sailor is going to be marrying his mother, his uh, attitude changes very quickly. And uh, that he and his friends conspire to kill the sailor. And I just told you about 90% of the story. So the thing of it, or 90% of the overall story. So the thing is, this is not a story that you read to find out what happens per se. This is a story that you read to get into the process, the thought processes of these characters. And what's interesting, this is why I say it's interesting that <clears throat> Mishima is so good at lulling you into a false sense of security about the mother and the sailor coming together and making you think that that's the primary thrust of the story, that that's that, that this is a love story and they're coming together. He really does a good job of diverting you. Now, I already knew where this was going because I'd already seen the movie, but he does do, <clears throat> if you never read it, an undeniably good job of taking your focus off in that direction. Uh, and all the while, you see this very sinister world that the sun belongs to, and it starts getting more and more, uh, more and more ominous as the uh, as the story goes on. And what's interesting is they the the gang the 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 philosophy believed by the gang is so fascinating because you can see how it really connects with a universal experience of being a teenager and the coming of age years <clears throat> factors so much into Mishima's stories, but you can see how it really plays upon a, a common experience in the coming of age years, which is they believe they, these, these boys uh, despise fathers. They hate fathers. Noboru's father has is, is passed away, but they hate fathers. They despise their fathers. They despise the concept of fatherhood. And in their mind, fathers are defeated men. They're neutered, castrated men that have been domesticated by women and that sort of thing. And so, and, and yes, there is like rank misogyny among their, um, 
uh, um, in, within their belief. But they, but really, what they despise are fathers that they feel have been torn down and domestic, or, or men that have been um, overpowered and domesticated by sentimentality and all of that. And so they think because um, they think because Ryuji has this job where he's out sailing the high seas that he's transcended all of that that he has um he he is a, is of a higher echelon and so they hold him in high regard and or he's held in high regard uh by Noboru and then uh it all you know it all comes crashing down when when it when Noboru sees that no this guy is still subject to the same desires and passions and wants and needs as any other man and what's interesting, though, is uh, there's, an, there's a passage where the chief is talking about how he just despised, you know, they, they, they're talking about how they despise fathers. He's talking about how fathers just tell you bullshit, like they just espouse bullshit to you and nonsense and crap. And, you know, it's the and it's these just um, and, and you really I, as, as they were describing what they're angry about, I started imagining like Clark Griswold in National Lampoon's Vacation where, you know, everything he says is, to his son is just superficial crap. You know, son, it's like this. They tell you that blah, blah, blah. And it's that that kind of condescending superficial nonsense that the dads get in the habit of doing. And I realized it's very interesting that Mishima said the age of the gang where he where it did at age about age 13 because in that part where you're just hitting puberty and you're kind of everything is kind of moving into the next stage of your life he is uh you know he's pointing out you really do realize at that point that's when you start to push away from your parents because you start to realize oh wait my parents my you know you start that's when you start pushing back against your parents you start realizing that adults are not perfect you start realizing that They've just been they, that they're not perfect. They're not sent from on high. They're just telling you the the the, the, the they're telling you whatever crap is going to get you through the day and kind of you know and it's it's not they're not really giving you an authentic. They haven't been giving you an authentic experience. They've been interacting with you in in the in terms of a persona, and that's a real thing that we all a real realization that we all uh, encounter and we all come to terms with. And so I think it's so interesting that Mishima takes that, uh, that as an opportunity to explore, you know, the idea of kids, really, a group of kids who really and truly feel betrayed by that, feel like the, um, uh, feel like the adults are not being honest with them, not being authentic with them, and, and carrying that anger and that frustration to the point of being murderous, of wanting to kill. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, we talk about epidemics of school shootings and things like that and teenagers driven to violence. And I think that the, I think that Mishima really has a finger on the pulse of something of that feeling like the world is not being honest with you, that betrayal that some people don't cope with that well. And I think he really captures something uh, brilliant there. The thing is, though, and again, I, I keep saying, if you, uh, you know, this is a spoiler-heavy story, but what's interesting to me is, you know, what's what's the most ominous thing of all is that it's heavily, heavily implied. Um, it's never, I, in, in the story, it's never made clear to Ryuji what this gang that his uh, soon-to-be soon stepson belongs to it's uh, it's never made clear to him what it is they believe, but in terms of his own internal monologue, as he's reflecting and he's thinking towards the end of the book, he is coming. He comes into agreement with their philosophy. In in essence, uh, he has he 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 finds himself at the end of the book in a headspace where he is of the same mind that they are. He has realized, you know, they've both been looking. They they've both been on either side of this thing, living lies. You know, Noboru has been living this lie, and, and he has been, um, throughout the story, one of the one of the first things that's emphasized, I don't want to give too much away, but he has a, a problem with voyeurism that gives you an idea of uh, the, the, super, the, the lie that he's been living. But he's been living this childhood lie, and uh, Ryuji's been living this adulthood lie, and in a very ominous and very dark and very disturbing way, they meet in the middle at the very, very end of the book. 
And so again, it's not a, it, there. There's more to it, obviously, than that. The story's more elaborate than that, uh, and there are certainly surprises along the way that I won't give away. But as far as the overall concept of the story, uh, it, it does not diminish your your enjoyment of it to know all of that. Um, and again, this is very much a story that you read for the sake of the writing itself. Mishima, this is what's so interesting to me. Mishima is a uh, is a prose writer par excellence, and there is something almost um, intrinsically Japanese about his writing, where he he has that very meditate this very meditative Zen like quality in the way he describes things. You get this feeling that no matter how intense the action is, the narrator whoever is telling us the story. Uh, they they have never left a very calm, zen-like state, and it really creates this very ominous atmosphere to experience that. His descriptions are beautifully worded, and it's so interesting because he can describe things in such a way that it just paints itself in your mind. You know, I can see exactly the the shipyard and the harbor that he describes and the, the um, high-end clothing store and all that. I can see all of that stuff that he describes beautifully. All of that imagery is described beautifully, but what's so amazing is within that, there's this extraordinary economy of language. And this is what's interesting, where um, I don't know if you, I don't know if conservative is a good word to describe Yukio Mishima's politics. I mean, he was very radical, you know, radical traditionalist might be the best way to look at that. But uh, But there is that conservative element in his writing in a very a very appropriately applied way where there's this wonderful economy of language where he just, he does not, he, you never feel like he's had to embellish anything. You always feel like he's just described everything with tremendous restraint. But within that restraint, he says exactly what he needs to just make the image form in your mind. And that is, that is a perfect example of why he's such a stunning, highly regarded writer in that regard. And this, this book is full of, um, uh, full of writing, uh, like that. Uh, I have another, I got another one of his books recently, um, called Life for Sale, which I think only just became available in English. And uh, I'm going to read that one at some point in the near future too. Um, I think that's actually, that's touted as being a comedy. So it'll be very interesting to see where that goes. But, um, Anyway, he, that that writing style, that precise rhythm of the language, if you haven't experienced it, that alone is worth reading his books. The only and that that holds up throughout the through the translation too. You know, a lot of translations, the the English translation becomes uh, clunkier, you know, and that kind of thing, and and, and stiffer, and and that sort of thing. Not the case here. Even and and his um, his widow uh, actually oversaw his estate and oversaw the translation of his books after his death. And just made like damn sure that, and he uh, in his life he sat down with a translator. Um, it was this woman I can't think of her name, but she translated um, a lot of his uh, a lot of his books while he was still alive. Sat down with her. He spoke fluent English, and he sat down with her and made damn sure that everything uh, was translated perfectly because he was craving that um, that acceptance by the American literary establishment. So. Um, so it's it's just beautiful writing and it holds up in the English. The only other writer I could compare his writing style to is Truman Capote. Like Truman Capote accomplishes the same thing as the probably the like the the American equivalent of Yukio Mishima in my mind. And um you know, you could read a book like Breakfast of Tif Breakfast at Tiffany's, which the actual novel of Breakfast at Tiffany's is much darker and more um much darker and much with a much darker unresolved ending than what you see in the no, in the movie, which the movie is amazing. I love the movie, but it's a it's made into a rom com. The book is much more um, is is much more serious in tone. But anyway, something like that, and compare that to something like this, and you can really feel the similar rhythm and the similar contemplative nature and that perfect economy of language. So. 
highly, highly recommend The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea. And uh, the movie, I you know, I, it's I had when I saw this, when I read this, I I've done several iterations of this video to get it right. I can't remember if I mentioned this already. When I read the book, I had already seen the movie, and uh, the movie is really good. Uh, it uh, stars Chris Christopherson and is put in a kind of white, Europeanized, anglicized uh, environment. It's really good, and it maintains. Uh, it maintains a lot of the, uh, you know, it's, it's very accurate to the book, aside from the, the ethnic and national differences, it's very accurate to the book. Um, play Plays up the character of the chief a little bit more in the movie, and I really liked what they did with the chief in that one. And Chris Christopherson plays the role well, you know, he's one of those... Uh, one of those actors that's very good at being kind of a man's man, you know, uh, kind of like a John Corbett type or somebody that's very, like, gruff but sensitive, that sort of thing. So he plays the role well, so I recommend the movie, too. Anyway, that's that, and uh, I've got uh, several more books on the uh, currently on the docket, so look forward to sharing them with you. Peace.